Hey ladies and gents, if you're here for Sunberg for our webinar, The Design of Storytelling, you're in the right place. I'm Linnea. And this is Jeeva. And today we'll be learning all about telling a cohesive story through our product, brand promise, and company strategy. So we're looking forward to that. First of all, we're really glad to see each and every one of you here. This is actually the finale of our 2019 webinar series, and it's been a really awesome ride this year, and that's thanks to all of you sharing your thoughts with us and coming back for more every time. So thank you for choosing to spend your lunch hour with us. In fact, we're going to add a special surprise for you today. We are having John Suh, Vice President and Founding Director of Hyundai Cradle, join us for the second half of the session today, all the way from San Francisco. So make sure you stick around for that. By the way, this is going to be an interactive session, and we'll be using the chat box today to send you important information and links as GVEC speaks. And it's also where you can ask us all your questions. So go ahead and open up that chat window on your Zoom screen and take advantage of the resources there. So without further ado, I'll introduce our very own webinar host extraordinaire, Zivek. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lenea. So Zivek, Zivek is an industrial designer. He's been in the industry for 23 years, and here at Sunberg Farrar, he is our energetic director of strategic growth. Apart from design and his love of design, Zivek also has a huge love of OCR, that is obstacle course running, and also bird photography, and he's been in some really cool, obscure parts of the world to get those perfect shots. So, uh, with it looks like we're getting a pretty good um, amount of people in the webinar now, so um, without further ado, let's get started and get into the meat of our discussion today. So, Zivek, do you want to take it away? Awesome. Thank you. And again, thanks for that poll. It was nice to see the football versus the leaves uh, kind of a battle happening. Uh, I did not poll. Uh, myself and Lanea did not poll, but I think my poll would go for the leaves, the amazing warm, uh, warmth, nature of the leaves as such. So, uh, today is about storytelling. I would say more the design of storytelling. Uh, and again, by the way, feel free to ask your questions as you go uh, forward with. I think we all are conversant with what's happening uh, in our chat box. Uh, I cannot even start, uh, and hopefully you can see me now uh, in the video. By the way, you can adjust the screens, you can have the slides to be more dominant or my mugshot to be more dominant as such. Uh, so we can always, you can always play with that. Uh, there's nothing more here than this. There will be something more uh, in the back. I think I need to start by at least proclaiming who my, at least my opinion, is the best storyteller ever in the world and who is also alive. There are plenty of other storytellers also. Uh, it's Bill Bryson. I just love his work, uh, especially that book right there, uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything. It's so thick. So it certainly might not be for the designer in you, but for the curious person in you. I will absolutely suggest that thing. By the way, let me ask what to show you. Uh, just yesterday, uh, I got my uh, expanding package. I had pre-ordered the book uh, of that guy, again, uh, The Body. Uh, I just got it, so I think over this weekend, I exactly know the work cut out for me. So storytelling is an art, is a science. Uh, uh, it's predominantly an art, but let's try to see how we can break it out and see how we can apply it to our world, the world of design of products or services or experiences. So when we say story, uh, really plenty of memories or the amazing movies or books or novels or essays or dramas or theater you must have seen, right? No matter, it's always a hero's journey. The hero can be a boy uh, or a girl or, or an animal. Uh, as such, we all have our own favorites as such from the journey uh, or entire storytelling as such. But if you really break any story, I'm not saying literally any story, it always goes something like this, at least the classical stories. I'm not talking about the latest abstract genre or something. There's a village. Uh, suddenly there's a problem at the outskirts. A dragon comes. Then there's a boy. Typically, in most of the stories, it's a boy. Almost lately, we have seen plenty of girls also. But some young person takes on it, saying, I'm going to slay that dragon. Right? Uh, they will go and try to do their own journey. Uh, they will try to go to an oracle or climb a mountain and eventually find their sword uh, or an axe or a fleece of golden wool, uh, whatever the story goes with, and then try to fight the dragon. 
and they fail for the first time. It might be a blow there, they take in, they come back, they lick their wounds, they train, uh, I would say, uh, more strongly, and then they go back again uh, to, uh, let's say, the, do the real fight, and then at the end, they become the hero. The hero comes back in the village, gets the damsel he has been waiting for, and everything is nicely, happily ever after. That has always been a hero's journey. If you try to put some parley back in the, our world of, of design and products and services, the first is the village, right? The context. We have to immerse ourselves in the context. Like as a plot of the story, they first let you know what the context is. Anything and everything will be on the context, right? Means the era, the time will define uh, what happens and in the time, the societal economical progression happens which defines what the context would be. Then the dragon, the problem, 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 the problem comes on your doorstep and then somebody has an idea. It might be an internal design team, an engineer, a salesperson, an operation person, an exterior studio, you will an idea. And then you go on your journey. You cannot just go with one hypothesis. You have to go and try to find options because to choose a, a design, you need to have certain options on the table. You generate those options and then you take your first solution or one of the solution that you think might have a good kind of and gravity towards it or weight and you go and do a pilot fight, right? A pilot test uh, in a small market. It might be a trade show. It can be strategic business modeling property as such. You go out there, you learn, you come back and you train, you refine yourself. Okay, now we got the main picture over there. Now let's go and try and work on the details. Never the other way around. It's in details, but only after you do the framework. And then you go and build and hand it over to your production team, making sure all the wrinkles have been ironed out. And then you just keep on doing the economies of scale. And then the hero, you become the hero, uh, the person with the idea or the uh, managing the ideas. And then the dollars are literally the hero's journey in, in your corporation. It's uncannily similar to what happens into any storytelling as such. But let's not just go with this kind of an immediate, uh, I would say, mirroring of what happens there and here. Let's try to see back on the world of, I would say, design or strategy, how we have to go and climb that mountain. Means I climb that, uh, I call that climbing the emotional mountain as such. So it's, uh, again, uh, I don't need to uh, address some of the things we addressed in the last uh, webinar, but we believe uh, as a studio, and we have been here for the last 85 years, not me and Lanea, uh, the studio has been here for the last 85 years, any successful product will have a recipe which is a very good blend of both the functional elements and also the emotional attributes. So we understand, we know, uh, all of us know what the functional elements are going to be. But in the world of emotional attributes, we have to climb that mountain. Eventually, we have to go and look at what is that storytelling. We have to go with the market, which builds all your product portfolio here, the next time horizon, the next time horizon, and which eventually based on all the inherent physics, right, or the world of feasibility as such. And it might, again, I know right now, looking at the list, by the way, we have a very good uh, group right now on the uh, on, on, on the uh, let's say webinar right now you might be from the OEMs it might be a supplier it might be anywhere in the creative supply chain everybody has to understand and climb the mountain let's start in the center we cannot just start in the features or thinking of solving a problem in just the feature set because no matter what eventually from the end user from the end storyteller the audience they are looking out for that experience on the top of the mountain. That's what they are here for. They buy something from you to add benefits in their life. If they have an emotional, an experiential, uh, kind of an aspirational mountain to climb, they are looking out for those benefits. But the benefits have to be nicely charted out, or I would say analyzed out in the world of design research into those attributes. Okay, now we can go one level down. What are the different attributes we want for the luxury segment or the mid segment or the starting segment? And then we can think about the features, not just start with features like, hey, we can make this, let's go and sell that. It may or may not fit in the experiential element that you want to. And then it feeds back the technology also, right? You have a dozen PhD people, you have hundreds of engineers. Engineers, they can design anything, but we have to appropriately let them know what feature content they have to design, which eventually aligns with the mountain we have to climb. And goes all the way back to the materials, like right? the color, the finish, the heft, the, the coldness, the warmthness of it. You want to 
cannot start in the world of, hey, we made this amazing concoction of compounding elastomer and let's try to see what it can uh, help in the market. You have to understand to make sure what is the final emotional stake at place. So let me be extremely clear. We are not expecting an engineer or a material scientist to go and do a design in experiential world. No, no, no. There are design studios doing just that. We would help you there. You might be having your own design studios to do that. Is making sure everybody in that creative supply chain understands why we are doing it, why we are doing that small code over here, why we are compounding a new material over here, why we are inventing this kind of a different contraption or a mechanical invention over there. Because at the end, the end user, the series of multi-users need to be in that emotional world completely satisfied, which connects to the marketing world of loyalty, right? That's how loyalty gets imbibed and comes back to again the return buy and the return sale as such. So. It's easy to tell them in the theoretical world. Let's try to take an example, right? Uh, uh, let's say me, and I think Lanea told me about my crazy uh, fun things. I do uh, what people do for fun. So OCR, I do not know. Uh, drop on the chat box if anybody on the web chat, uh, web, uh, right now on the webinar, uh, and, uh, knows this or does this, I would like to uh, give you a high five. It's a world of OCR, obstacle course training. So you run half a mile, you do an obstacle, run half a mile, do an obstacle. Might be a monkey bar, sandbag carry and all those weird stuff getting extremely cold and muggy and, and muddy and icy. Uh, by the way, I help it. So I help it and I love it. So I want to go there. So what is the emotional mountain that I want to climb? I, want, I know what I want over there. But if I want to go and buy my gear, I want to buy an object. I just want, and by the way, that's the exactly shoe uh, I wore uh, when I ran uh, last weekend uh, south of Chicago at Attica, Indiana. So I cannot start designing a shoe unless I understand what the end user here, me, wants to go and wants to have. So if I want to chart out those things for this particular object, it will be something like this. Like, what is the experience finally I want? Like, it's again, this is not unlike Maslow's hierarchy, but Maslow's hierarchy is for people, for humans. It, this is now for products. If I want to still understand where I want, I want to be proud, the satisfaction of things, the feeling of achievement. That is what I want from that activity. How it goes into the benefits, no matter what, there are some selfish benefits over here. I want to make sure it helps in my health and fitness goals, in my strength and endurance to make sure I keep on playing or make sure I keep on daily dialing on weekends or here and there. Then the attributes for that mission, not for the vision of benefits, but attributes for that kind of a race, right? I want to end the race, I want to finish the race, but with no injury. I do not want to roll my ankle, I don't want to blow out my ankle. All those things are always there. I have to come here at the end of the day or at the start of the week and start working or keep on working. So those attributes have to be there apart from the experiential world. Then it comes back to the features like, okay, can we do the fastest shoelaces time uh, as such? Can we have a completely sure traction? The drainage, we are going in and out of water, right? How to manage water going in and also manage water going out. So those will only come because we understand the context over there. Then it goes back one more level, like, okay, now technology. How to make those features? What are the new machines we want to bring in or understand climate comfort technology or other things? And then it might come back to the world of durometers of the materials, right? What is the shore hardness? We cannot start in the lower of the mountain as such. We have to climb back the journey. So by the way, the onus is on the design, I would say the design team you have, either external like us or internal like you, who make sure this kind of an understanding is there throughout the entire creative supply chain, all the way down to the suppliers also. They need to understand why they're playing with those bricks because eventually you're going to build a wall and the wall is going to be of a museum. They have to understand the larger picture to make sure everybody knows the morale is there and they're completely aligned in doing what you have to do. And that's essentially the way I would break out the storytelling part of us, of not just making sure the part and the process is there, but how you break down to your own internal innovation culture. And the innovation culture becomes a big kind of an appropriation of this process where the innovation strategy team, the design team, the industrial design team goes out to the ends of the world, uh, literally uh, going across all the seven, uh, seven oceans of the world, and making sure everybody who is going to contribute to that particular, uh, I would say, emotional example, understand that particular area. So the story is there. We want to make sure the end user, the multi-user, it's always multi-users, we know that. And then the, comes back to product. So the product makes sure that it has to align at every space as you go in the mountain. 
So that's still, an, I would say, an everyday example. Uh, let's try to look at why we are going to do that, because no matter what, we are humans. And there is the reptilian brain and then there is the cognitive brain too. The rational mind is always there, but the emotional mind overrides the national, uh, national, uh, not national, uh, rational mind every time. I was looking at the uh, time clock as such. Because the rational mind will always say, I need this, versus the emotional uh, mind will say, I want it. And like, the thing is, how much it does cost, it comes to you, but it happens after your mind looks at something like, bang, I want that piece of machinery or that tool or that utensil in my, in my, in my kitchen. So that's where you try to think about wanting one, right? Means you want a beautiful, fast muscle car. The first thing, the emotional world, you eventually will try to sell it to your wife or the other way to your spouse in saying why you want it. And then once you want it, you are not worried about having it in stock or Amazon only has two of them left. Can you imagine nowadays you want to search something, Amazon, Amazon says only two left in stock, like whom they are fooling. Amazon is the, uh, right now ruling uh, the inventory of the entire world. So stock is always there, but if it is not there on Amazon, the onus is on you where I will go and find it somewhere else. We always talk about income, discretionary income or what alignment would be for that. In a way, if they really fall in love, it's your product and we can talk about love uh, eventually as a pretty big contribution of what we do uh, in the design of everyday things, maybe not in the technical uh, kind of and tools. But if they really want something, they will literally ask the question to themselves, what other things in my life can I do without? The coolness overrides a lot and that's where the psychology of cell happens and eventually you rationalize them by being useful, usable, ergonomics, affordability, all those will come in the rational mind too. So that the right part is basically the story part and the left part is actually your plot, your process, I would not say process, your methodology, your approach to make sure the end human is exchanging their hard earned money to give you or get them the benefit and the benefit comes from your product or your service or your experience as such. Uh, by the way, let me just remind you, uh, not remind you, let, let me just inform you, I think we got a very good feedback from our last uh, uh, webinar, it was the, uh, the, uh, the beauty, the beast in industrial design, plenty of people love the name also, or the play on words, so we actually transferred or transcribed that webinar into a pretty decent uh, article, uh, and it's there on our website also, but Lanea would be pushing the link of that right now, as we say, in the chat box. So if you like that or you want to share that with your friends or your colleagues, feel free forward to uh, send them the link and they can download the article. You don't have to fill any form or nothing. Yeah, it's, it's just enjoy the article. And if you like it, uh, reach back to us. If you don't, uh, well, you will not reach back to us. But as we go forward uh, with a real world scenario in the world of mobility, uh, if you have any, uh, I would say, uh, storytelling, I would say appreciation for you, like, if you have any story that has guided you or any story that might have molded your childhood uh, days, let us know. It might be Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. Yeah, I love that particular thing. I always looked out for that cave where there's plenty of gems or anything else that just helped you understand what the story is. You can just drop them on the chat box and if there are a couple of things that might segue into the next part of the program, we will just say some people are liking this versus something, something else. Uh, but we like to do that, use the chat box for asking questions as we are going to go forward with. We will try to answer them at the end, not just me. Uh, we will have John Sir, uh, the Executive Vice President of Hyundai Innovation Labs, the Cradle Labs over here, and that will be a fantastic thing too. So trying to segue to that context as such, uh, we, will, uh, we will go to the next kind of an story uh, in a way, but the story that we got paid for, uh, how we try to utilize that. Because when we say design is not just for here and now, that's the incremental design, but eventually as you go to the radical design, the breakthrough design, literally looking at the future, how the future is going to unfold, you as a corporation or a design uh, entity have to make sure you sow the proper seeds in doing that. So case in point, like in the world of mobility, right now most of you in the morning must have done a commute like this. My car is all the way in the back, no, I'm just kidding, but something like that. But what happens when a natural disaster hits, right? And nowadays, not, I should say nowadays, more and more natural disasters are happening to an urban populated area. And the search and rescue efforts and the amount of people die of these things is 
really going uh, going uh, pretty pretty high. So uh, we were working with one of our clients, uh, and the client is Hyundai Cradle, and that's where John uh, is a part of uh, that kind of a leadership as such. They said, okay, let's try to tackle this problem. This is one of the problems going out in the future. It's happening more and more. It might be Hurricane Katrina or a uh, hailstorm or electricity going out or tornadoes. These things are happening more and more to the urban areas. So the thing is, in a way, the last mile approach is being solved or almost been solved. The problem in cases like this is the last 100 yards. Means even a military Humvee cannot ac go across these last pieces of debris to go and rescue that patient who needs that immediate assistance. So the Hyundai said, okay, let's try to solve at least this slice uh, of a problem in the world. What would be the best mechanism? What would be the best mobility vehicle to go and help in that particular area? How to literally understand that? So out of myriad of options on the wall that we parked uh, on the idea parking lot, one of the things I was like, hey, what if cars could walk? Like, like, okay, that's a pretty interesting hypothesis. But then if you have an hypothesis and you want to make it as a pretty good presentable solution, you have to go through literally the structured way of industrial design thinking. And that's what we did. Like, and that's what they uh, commissioned us to do. And it is a part, it, it is a one exploration of a pretty big uh, two, three year kind of a project as such. But one thing was, okay, the vehicle would still be the vehicle. But then in the cases of emergency things like this, what will happen if it can walk? What will happen if it can travel? Traverse the terrain of let's say five feet kind of and gash in the ground or go over a fence. All the things that are not just needed in the world of rescue or military, but sometimes eventually the world of agricultural world or building new trains or building new play, uh, not planes, trains, uh, roads as such. So we try to explore things in that particular area. And right now we are in Detroit, Michigan. It's pretty cold today. Winter is going to come down on us pretty soon. The thing is, if you see the vehicle on the left, the suspicion will be passive 99% of the time. But once when that accident happens and the vehicle or accident, you slid and you go in the ditch, your vehicle can immediately crawl back on the surface and off you go to the work or your camping trip. Not camping during that weather, but where you want to go. Or the other part is infrastructure in a way, the architectural one is not going to change anyway pretty fast, right? So literally in the world of, let's say that's Manhattan, downtown New York, the architecture is set and if the promise is going to go of an autonomous vehicle, the vehicle can come to the curb, but how it can finally come, it can walk through your flower beds and be even keeled to your door cell. So a person who let's say is handicapped in this kind of a story can completely seamlessly go in and go where he or she needs to go. That is the promise of the pure autonomy from door to door or door sill to door sill kind of a perspective. So in a way, they, uh, Hyundai, uh, along with us, try to make sure how we can liberate that. And that's why the concept was born with, okay, can we articulate uh, the suspension to be in the leg-like kind of a perspective? It can be uh, mammalian trait, it might be reptilian trait, and we uh, did plenty of uh, mechanism designs uh, in those areas too. Another thing is then the next part comes about not just pointing a uh, story, but making sure we do literally full uh, cases of CAD modeling, exteriors and interiors along with engineers too. So once we have the story, the emotional story, the mountain part of what we want to solve, then it comes down to make sure, okay, we get the proper, I would say, physical, mechanical, electrical teams together. Again, it's, it's kind of a uh, bench uh, uh, studio engineering. We are not solving all the intricate problems of, of, of molding or injection molding devices right now, but we still are not selling a $3 uh, bill as such. Then goes to the world of reality. That's a real physical model built. So we can actually understand how it's going to be in the shape, the proportion of the form, the volume, still maintaining the current volumes we have uh, on, on our roles right now. It goes further, right? We have our team over here. By the way, we are a design studio, joined at the hip from design and mechanical engineering and electronics and ele mechatronics engineering. So we made sure uh, we also did in the same vein uh, a, uh, an actual uh, robotic model of what the hypothesis is. So our engineers worked along with our designers and as you can see on the screen right now, it can go into the mammalian mode, it can go into the reptilian mode and it can try to go uh, and add uh, to the uh, progress of it. So the, in, uh, the internally uh, it makes a pretty uh, bold sample as such and then eventually you can go more forward into the future and try to understand how that, how that is going to be liberated or not. 
So again, we understand the story, we, and we enjoy climbing up the mountain, what is this aspirational, emotional, uh, experiential part, and then making sure you transfer that with the product over there. This is again still, as you see, the journey is not completely over. It has not reached the last end as such. We might be in the first pilot area, might be in the solution area as such. So this is again a future casting element as such, but you still bring out an hypothesis from the mind to paper to a physical form and then actually showcasing it to the world to make sure how we are going to get responses from them from the end user or also from the supplier uh, as such too. We have to make sure we collaborate with them. So now the story is there and then we can uh, try to go and understand on that mountain, if you are a material supplier, engineering supplier, mechatronic supplier, how you can go and add to the story as such. So using the story internally to design a product, but also using the story to understand where we have to go and take all the, our innovation suppliers to the place we want to. And that's actually a good way to go in the future, apart from making sure you're investing into the, in, uh, I would say, the incremental innovation and the boundary level innovation also. Uh, one, two or three more things I would like to cover before we will get uh, our uh, last segment started. Uh, we already have John sir uh, in the studio. Uh, hello John, just bear with us for five minutes more. Uh, the thing is the ecosystem, right? The ecosystem, the context, when you talk about the village, understanding what is the context of that. The context of camping, those are the context of making that tent. The context of an office will understand finally what the office chair has to be. And I think as I think Lane was mentioning, we are we have been doing that since last 85 years now, since 1934 uh, in the worlds of everyday use, professional use, contractor use, till right now. We are literally doing the same element, understanding the story, understanding the context of the company or the business and what their aspirations are, and then making, making sure you're doing that. So it might still be a design of a toaster, right? We did for Kenmore, but understanding the context, uh, the aspirations, the core competencies, and then you come out and make sure you understand the process. And the same thing goes for medical product or vehicle design product also. So what is the recipe of a successful story? We, we started with the blend of functional and emotional elements, but there might be two elements that might, I will bring to the surface and then we can, uh, we can pause. One thing is stop trying to be all things to all people. Start by being something to someone. That doesn't mean just do one product. That means when you are doing one product, it might be a Prius or it might be a Ford GT to each her own, right? But when you're doing to do a hybrid uh, fuel sipping uh, Prius and understand the entire context of what is the emotional mountain that person is going to be looking out for, the attributes, the benefits, and then do the feature list of what they would love to have in their product and what they will be okay not to have in the product. And the same thing goes for a supercar or a muscle car as such. And the second is, the future, right? And that's what the most important part is. Whatever we do as a product or service or experience would not be consumed immediately unless you are in that kind of a world. It will always have a lag. So when you go in the future, as we saw, the ecosystem of camping also is important. But more important is the future trends of what will be in the camping or office or mobility. We saw some of them right now. So it's not just the possible future or the plausible, like I wish I could, I wish I would, not those futures, the generative future, where you understand, okay, this of the entire elements, this is where we want to go as a company, right? There will be millions of needs in the world, just like millions of stars in the sky, is what constellation you choose to solve, which one you understand, and then you, along with your internal team, along with your external studio and your suppliers, you generate that future and you start sowing the seeds of the generative future as you go. Because one thing is for sure, no matter what, uh, machines it, it are simple to build. The humans are complex. Understanding the complexity of humans is more important and then we need to understand which mechanisms or which I would say physical manifestations have to be in that product, in that vehicle, in that kiosk, in that packaging element to make sure we understand those things. And there will be no other person who tells that in a very amazing quote and other than Marshall McLuhan, everybody experiences far more than he understands. And that's the cognitive level, right? The understanding, the remembering, the learning, the teaching. But these experiences, rather than the understanding, so rather than cognition, that influences our behavior. And that's where the complexity goes pretty, pretty strong in. And that's where design research comes in to understand, okay, for what attributes we want to solve, rather than for what all the mechanical elements we want to add it over there. 
and I think uh, that should be enough for this segment. By the way, this is not the end. Now our second segment st starts. Uh, thank you for being at least, I would say, for your attention for the first part. And now we come to the, the last but the amazing part uh, of our webinar. John, please come on in. Join us. Back. This is just for you. All right, thank you. And and I think uh, the uh, the I think the webinar people know that you will be joining us. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lania did introduce us, but I will try to introduce you in a little bit more a bit. So and you can uh, add to it too. But the best thing is uh, I would say uh, to talk about John is uh, apart from what you do that you will tell. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm really happy here because I'm just a designer, <laughs> but to sit here with a doctor of Stanford himself, like I, I think when people ask me what memories are made, I said, this is the way I make my memory. So I'm just happy uh, with your extensive you. background, I mean, BS in mechanical engineering, MS in mechanical engineering, PhD in, uh, from Stanford, and so many things. By the way, you were the captain of the bicycling team yeah, when you're doing you, your PhD. PhD. How yeah. do you find time between? Your yeah. amazing work and your hobby. Well, you know, all work, no play. <laughs> I'm a really dull graduate student, yeah. so I, I did. I, you know, do you still cycle? I don't do it as much, but but I did occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. yeah. By the way, John is our fearless leader from Hyundai Cradle. He's the founder and the executive uh, the chairman, VP of Hyundai Cradles, yeah. and all the other things. So, by the way, the project we talked about, uh, the uh, the walking uh, yeah, vehicle as such which was showcased this year at CES show. That's right. Uh, that was done by uh, this gentleman right over here and we were just uh, privileged to be working with you. But let's, we can go anywhere we want. Let's try to have some fun. Sure. Talking about fun, apart from cycling that you did when you were uh, in earlier days, what do you do for fun? I uh, I like to read, actually. Awesome. Yeah, I like to read. I was just that. showing uh, the, the <laughs> I, I, this is my favorite uh, author, uh, Bill Bryson. Oh, yeah. I just had ordered, this was on the pre-order for this thing, so I got in the first week's order. Uh, he's my favorite storyteller. Which is your favorite storyteller? Or there might be many. So, uh, um, science fiction is what I really enjoy reading. Oh, yeah. Uh, probably the Frank Herbert uh, Dune series. Fantastic. It's one of my all-time favorites. So science fiction in general, but I also like reading about space and space nice. exploration, space aging. This was given the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 on J July. Uh, it was a great opportunity to kind of read books about the space age and so on. Of course, a lot of great TV shows about that too. Did you see the CNN, the documentary, the Apollo 11? Not the Hollywood uh, one. CNN actually had a documentary so which they, actually showed you, have you seen that? I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. it actually shows the live footage yeah. of all the astronauts, Neil Armstrong, what he was doing two minutes prior to going up over there. Yeah. They just had a musical uh, a track on it and a, and a narration. Yeah. But everything was during that time. That's right. It just still gives me goosebumps. Yeah. I think you yeah. must have mentioned that. I think when they actually showed the launch of the entire Saturn V rocket, the yeah. biggest and still the strongest expendable rocket ever made, <laughs> it starts with the countdown of this big mechanical beats like 10, yeah. 9, and eventually the last 3, 4, 5 ones are, I would say, more hard beats. Yes. So it, it, the, the, the change over there they did from yeah. the mechanicalness to completely the emotional part of it, it, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that was masterful, right? Ma masterful. And it was quiet, and then he said the launch, and you see this, this, the original smoke come up, and as the exhaust and it begins to develop, it just gets sucked back in, and it's That's like, wow, right? And I, still gives me goosebumps. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's and by, by anyway, one of my other uh, not favorite author, but I love to listen to his podcast is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He also mm -hmm. does a pretty yeah, much, I would right. say, uh, good storytelling part of breaking down the world of astrophysics and yeah. astronomy and a little bit of aviation for an, a lay person to understand. So yeah. uh, he came out with a decent book, I think it's called Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. It's pretty, pretty a small read. It's a pretty interesting <laughs> right. read. I read that uh, one too. Oh, you have? Oh, <laughs> man. Oh, awesome. And I think when, when people ask him what is his favorite book, uh, it's Gravitation. I don't remember the author right now, but there are so many amazing... Kip Thorne. Yo, man, I should, I should do that because I added that to the list when I was listening to his podcast okay. as such. So, fiction, uh, non-fiction or fiction? Uh, also, mostly, I would say a lot of, lot of uh, non-fiction. Uh, uh, non non-fiction? Yeah. That's, that's, so. that's, that's where I am actually. Yeah. So, I think you might have answered that, might not have. I know you do amazing things in work and also in personal life. Mm. What inspires you? Where do you seek out inspiration? Um, well, it's, um, 
Uh, uh, you know, to, to be candid uh, with you, I think... This is just the world of broadcasting. We can right. be as candid as we can. Um, I think it is... Um, the question is about joy. Yes. And, and joy in life. And what, what is it that is leads to, leads to joy? And I think I, the best way I, I'd like to put this is in a, a movie, um, uh, Chariots of Fire, hmm. uh, which, which was, in, I think, in the 80s. I and, seen uh, that. And it is... A, it's a story of two runners, I think the 1924, 1930 Olympics. Um, and one of the characters is Eric Liddell. And uh, he was, he grew up as a, uh, his family was a missionary to China. Okay. And, uh, uh, but he wanted to run uh, in the Olympics. And uh, his sister was not quite so happy with him in his running pursuits and uh, athletics. And he pulls her aside in this one point in the movie, and, and she says to her, he goes, Jenny, you know, um, the Lord made me for a reason, and uh, he made me, uh, he made, me for, made me for a purpose. He, said, he made me for China, which is where his family was serving as missionaries. And they were on a sabbatical. Okay. And she smiles because, it's, oh, okay, my Eric is coming to his senses, right? He's going to quit this running nonsense and go back to, to, uh, to China. He goes, and he also made me fast. <laughs> and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Right? And so that, to me, captures what I think. And I think each and every one of us, you, me, all of us listening, we all have a God-given talent, gift, makeup that is unique in the world. And I think part of it is just realizing what that is and then expressing that some way or the other. And so it's really, yes, we can seek accolades and accomplishments by others, but I think for me it's like what is the thing that is I'm going to feel God's pleasure. That's, that's pretty interesting. Honest. And you have a nice voiceover. He can be a great Lanai voiceover for some of the movies, right? And I make it run faster. You can, I could feel that kind of an, uh, tone changing. I wish I had a voice. I already have an accent. I, don't, I cannot have an amazing voice like that. But the thing is, I think uh, last, to last week, no, last week, uh, the first sub two hour marathon yeah. uh, uh, element was uh, broken by Eliud. Yeah. I don't know the last name or I don't pronounce the last name, but that was fascinating, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sub two. Yeah. It means I dabble into runs, means I do marathons and uh, obstacle course running and I just did an obstacle course last weekend, it was half a marathon and obstacles. Uh -huh. But just the amount of volume of physical training he must have gone through yeah. and the mental perseverance of just, yeah. he just, I don't know if you saw the entire game, it's only two hours. He just yeah. runs like a bullet all the way, right? like what's happening? Like, right. And at the end, he did not collapse or vomit, nothing. He's just like em embracing his wife and just like, yeah, yeah, he could still run for 20 miles more. Right. That's, that is an amazing, I think. And, yeah, and, and I think it's a good lesson because it, it, I'm sure it was painful, but he could do it. And I think that's a lesson for all of us in that, that our gift or our, our joy doesn't mean it's pain free. It means we can endure the pain. We can right. endure the difficulties and obstacles that come in our way because we believe it to be something in, yeah. in our core. So, so it's not a pain-free existence, but it means that we can get through those things which makes it. I sound. love that because I think what you're saying is, and this is maybe you're writing notes, you should write it down. I think pain is given, suffering is not. Yeah, right? right. Because yeah, yeah. if physical, let's say you're just benching 250 pounds or something, pain will be there, but you're not suffering because you are yeah. finally climbing your emotional mountain. We are talking yeah. about emotional mountain yeah, over there. Right. This is what you exist for. Yeah. Pain will be there. You will get cramps. You will just go for the change. But how yeah. do you go and make sure you properly train and then go through that kind of thing? The easiest way is go through it. Do you run? I do run. It's, it's more, I guess, for health. It's okay. not, not necessarily a thing I, I enjoy, but it's, it's, it's one of the most, for me, the most efficient and effective forms of physical uh, you know, uh, exercise that I can do. I think uh, I've been talking about putting a long story right over here, like 14.5 million uh, billion years of Earth, and then us, uh, let's say, as humans, finally coming over here. I do not know whether you have heard this theory, and it's a pretty good theory. I, I should believe in. Is uh, there are so many animals, like mm. snakes have amazing fans and thermal sensing, and lions have claws and teeth and we have nothing. I Means how did we even survive, right? I Means we are not strong. We are not things. But the main element they said is our ability to run, mm. and not just fast running. So cheetah or a deer, yeah, they will just run away. But a, a deer will run for it will sprint and it has to sit down. A cheetah will have mm. to sprint because right. of the fur on them. It becomes yeah. so hot. They will just have to come and just sit down. For us, since we are naked, means naked means uh, as compared <laughs> to a lion or tiger. 
the ability to perspire and have endurance run right. is what made us more stronger to bring down bigger animals. So we always hunted like a dog, like a pack, and right. we will always go and outrun. So if we go and identify a deer and just yeah. start running behind it, it will sprint, sprint, sprint. It cannot endure. It will just go and stop and right. just sit down, and that's why you go and get the kill. So. I, I would say, don't run because you ate a pizza slice yesterday, <laughs> run because it's in your genes, not, not these genes, the real genes as such. And that, it, it's a, you're right, it's, bicycling is good, but you're using a machine. Yeah. It's, it's cheating in a way, <laughs> if you want to be purist. Running is, get yeah, a sneaker, yeah. a good sneaker, right. I would say, yeah. and just, yeah. just run, it's, it's you. Yeah. I love trail runs, yeah, so I just okay. love a little bit more scenery. Yeah. Uh, even yeah, in Michigan great. in winter, I try to go. Uh, uh -huh. But because the first five minutes are painful, yeah. but once you generate body heat, <laughs> yeah. you literally throw all the things uh, as such. I thought I might not be able to do that, but I somehow uh, try to awesome. try to do that. So, awesome. inspiration. Uh, I, I like the way uh, yeah, you just you're yeah, answering perfectly. <laughs> like I, I don't know. I thought it will be like, how can I uh, tie me you or something? <laughs> we were talking about storytelling today, uh -huh. and, and we actually had a couple of questions. By the way, uh, I, I think you will have questions too. Uh, Maybe after five minutes or something, we can take some questions uh, back and we both will try to answer them. Today I have, maybe I, we can have uh, John answer everything. Okay. It will be my uh, uh, vacation today. Uh, <laughs> but we're talking about emotional experiences and storytelling. Hmm. Anything uh, in your uh, upbringing, childhood, that some story or some character uh, became so strong that it helped you mold your way or a life or approach? Yeah, I, th I think one of the things, uh, the other thing that, that I find motivational or interesting is exploration. Um, and I, I mentioned space exploration, yep. but, but there's also other forms of exploration. Certainly uh, things like in the, uh, you know, so we'll say the 13, 14, 1500s, let's say, when, when, when ocean uh, going explorations for, from, from Europe uh, and other places too, of course, uh, as, as we know now, uh, to other parts of the world, and, and uh, that and Arctic or Antarctic exploration, and um, that was. Uh, I always wonder, it's like, you know, these people don't have internet, uh, cellular, <laughs> or satellite. Uh, they can't phone home, and they're just out there for months. Yeah. And and the maps are inaccurate at best, uh, misleading, uh, most likely. And uh, um, and so they went out on these voyages, which many of them died. And uh, you know, for, and of course, they were motivated for you know for for commerce reasons or what have you. But still, it was just an amazing thing to say. Okay, I'm going to leave home. I'm going to be on this boat, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to get home, but maybe I will. And, and I think that is and coming uh, home will be after two or three years. It's right. not. It's not two or three weeks. Right. Yeah. And nobody knows. Right. Exactly. <coughs> that was that was the real exploration. Talking about exploration and I mean running and human genes. Hmm. Uh, I read that book, uh, The Short History of Nearly Everything. It talks about Darwin. Uh, was not supposed to be on IMS Beagle at that time. <laughs> so the reason, mm -hmm. you say about the painful journey, uh -huh. uh, before, uh, so uh, they were trying to, uh, British Armada was pretty strong, they were trying to chart out all the waters, so they just send a vehicle, or basically a ship, mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years, it will go and chart some area and again come back. For the three consecutive earlier, uh, I would say, uh, journeys, the captains of the ship killed themselves. <laughs> Because the journey is again, as you said, there is there is uh, there is sickness, uh, there is yeah. mutiny, there is yeah. nothing there. You are alone, <laughs> and at that time, let's say, captain is always a gentleman, uh, as such. So he will, will always lose his senses because everybody else was, in a way, a sailor. They were not yeah. gentlemen. They were, at that yeah. time, classes were pretty strong. So they devised a way to make sure. And every day, or not every day, every day on the ship when he's having dinner, he will have a gentleman to talk with, high-level mm -hmm. thinking to make the mental uh, more okay. pretty active. Mm -hmm. And in that list, our Darwin, as we know, uh, Darwin, the theory of evolution, uh, he was the second on this. He even did not get selected. Oh. But he was gentleman because he uh, he did his college in theology. Uh, he actually Darwin was more interested in just uh, earthworms. That's it. That was his passion in life. But he was using all these forms of observation, exploration, mm -hmm. and amazing documentation of, and always, yeah. always making it an open question, like why yeah. is this happening? Why, why, why? Twenty times, he was he, he did that pretty nicely. The first guy two weeks ago who was chosen to be the gentleman with him, mm -hmm. he <laughs> fell sick. So I said, okay, oh, who's the next guy? Darwin, you come in. Darwin, I'm not kidding this. Darwin was not selected by the captain because he had a funny nose. 
<laughs> so he said, okay, Darwin comes in and then his history. For two and a half years, he went everywhere with him. He made exceptional notes, the Darwin yeah. Finches, right? Why right. is the Finch here and here different? And the notes, and he suddenly realized, it's very difficult to, if you are in the forest, you cannot see the forest, right? Yeah. But to be in the, if, if we, some of us believe in evolution, if you are in that element, it's very difficult to say like we are evolving. It's impossible to do that. But the way he uses power of thinking, yeah. uh, he actually went exploring and brought back, just like, that's what they did. And that's, you're right, it's just exploration makes your mind wander. It's yeah. nice to come back and roll in the wandering yeah. thoughts sometimes. But I think what you're saying is we have to pulsate. We have to go beyond in the visionary mode and be again real and come back in the granular mode and actually do something. Yeah. Go beyond and back. I think pulsation is pretty... This is good. We are getting some quotes <laughs> out, of, out, of, out of this as such. Are there, should we take any questions? Are there any questions that you think we should go along with? Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Lanaya. Mm -hmm. How do you introduce a completely radical product to the market in the right way? How do you make sure it will be well received by telling the right story? This is right your alley. Mm. Something like that or something like that. How do you introduce a completely radical product to the market in the right way? So I would say, um, it's a great question, two, two really great questions, Noah. I, I, I think um, what I've seen is that, now this is not to be cliche or to, 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 to minimize your question, because it's a great one. Uh, I think the first part is a lot of luck. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to have luck, but I'm just saying that, especially if you're talking about a completely radical product <clears throat> to the market, I think it, it does, you have to, we have to all recognize in our own lives, actually, luck is actually, in my belief, uh, a, a part of our everyday life, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, in, in, given that I'm in the automotive industry, we hear the statistics all the time that, you know, in the U.S., we have, you know, 38, 40,000 deaths per year through to traffic fatalities. That is a lot of people. And so that I am not among them yet is kind of luck, right? yeah. if, if, if you will. Um, and, and so uh, <clears throat> I think what it means is we have to, um, for me, that means it, I can relax a bit, right? Doesn't, not, not so much I can, like, take it easy, but... Let's, let's be honest and say that sometimes there's a luck component that makes it or, or not. And, and so we do our best. We hopefully are doing things that which are, for us, brings us joy and that we are giving ourselves something that comes from the inside. And, um, and I think that, that can be the, the right way to, to bring it. Right? Hopefully... Not out of, uh, I would say, if, if your ambition is to uh, be recognized and to be known, there are a lot of people that do that, I know, and probably are, are successful at, at that, but I, I think the right way is to do it from a way that is from your, your, your inner self and to recognize that, that luck is going to play a role. You can get bitter about it, I get yeah. that, but, but I, I think we have to recognize that luck does play a role That's every cool. single moment. I mean, I could, I'm flying to Chicago tonight, that plane could... Crash, right? <laughs> and, and what you're saying is, when it's, I would say, I will completely second it because it's not just right here, right now. It's, let's say, John or Jim or anybody else, everybody, whoever we are right now, from both the sides of our progeny, from the mom's side and the dad's side, and I'm trying to paraphrase what Bill Bryson said in his, in his big book is, we were just lucky enough that not one of our ancestors from both the sides was not eaten, squashed, devoured, stuck fast, wounded in its quest to make sure that mating happens and the next one comes. So it's not just you and me right now here, but if you go back all the way to those millions or maybe at least 200,000 years as such, that all of them were alive. And then now literally it comes, the onus is on back of us who are here right now, 7.2 billion people. And we are that, I would say, the next spearhead of the evolutionary train of what to do with this planet or what to add to this planet. And literally the onus is on us because we are lucky, not just we, the entire, because the entire line is lucky with that particular thing. Sometimes it might stop, plenty of people it stops, plenty of families it doesn't, but we are those lucky few. And apart from luck, eventually comes to the perseverance and understanding and yes, learning absolutely. and applying yourself to going to Stanford and coming back. <laughs> so it's not lucky to be in Stanford, Stanford as such, but I think both of them play a major role. Anything can happen. Right. And then what, the last part about your second, second question, I would say... And that was, how do you make sure it will be well received by telling the right story? I'm just and, and I think part of it is just make, keeping it personal. 
uh, there, there's probably some personal thing that you can share about about your story and why you're doing this product or, or offering, and I think that is always interesting to hear. Awesome. Okay. Uh, this might be, this is from James, uh, might be in a similar vein as such, but how do you make sure a product is not just a cool idea and works for the user? Uh, I think uh, that's a pretty good one. I mean, yeah. coolness is, yeah, please yeah. go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, and, and it says, you know, but it's actually viable from a business standpoint and technical standpoint. So for me, I think there's no shortcutting this one that you really need to be in front of customers or potential customers and then talking and listening to them. I think that that is a really, really important because I am prone to the first part of your question. I'm, in, I'm really into the cool idea and to the, the thing that kind of wows me, right? But I'm, in, I'm an audience of one. Um, I really need to have the discipline and the willingness to um, hear someone say that's a stupid or a crazy idea or no, nobody wants that, you got to be open to that, right? Yeah. That's how you, if you're open to that, then, then I think you have a chance at, at, at being something viable from a business and, and, and also te the technical part too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would just add, I mean, when we say cool idea, the coolness doesn't always, make, it has to be just the attractiveness or the aesthetics or the beauty part of it. Beauty plays a major role. If it is, it is works good, why can't it look good? So we go that. But the coolness also derives its meaning from the context it is in. So if it is a medical product design, then it might not be completely having uh, 100 points from the beauty perspective, but how the coolness will derive its meaning from how it works with all the peripheral equipment, how it literally understands the mission at stake, when it has to literally, literally crave for your attention, or sometimes just be in the back because it's monitoring all the things over there. So the coolness for a tool industry, for a mechanical kind of a garage tool kind of a thing, uh, it might be a different element too. So the coolness even have to be, I would say, when you talk about success, right, uh, we are doing about product. So when we say it has to be a successful product, again, the success can be a different definition from every corporation in the same category. In the same way, the coolness, uh, I would say, uh, would also be a definition to have of what level of coolness is good from your brand and your brand promise also. Will we add something more? Sure. Uh, uh, that's pretty important. Toby, and then we have storytelling changes across the character. Yes. It's a pretty good question. Maybe try to change a little bit at the end. It's okay. from Cindy. How does the storytelling of your product change across, I would say not categories, but across, I would say, different marquees? Let's mm. say we have a luxurious <coughs> brand and let's say a sports brand and an everyday a bread and butter brand. Uh, would the higher echelon of the entire brand story has to be same or similar or can the individual marquees find their own story places? Yeah, it's, I, I think I think you do need. Yeah, I think you do need to have a different uh, storytelling strategy. I think that's really important because it's really about who the buyer is, right? And so, uh, very simply, it's uh, end consumer individuals, you know, you and me and so on, to uh, corporations or even governments uh, at the other spectrum, right? And so, your I think understanding of their pain point, needs, budget risk profile, problems they want to solve, uh, even, even how they are rewarded uh, at the end of the year by their boss, their performance appraisal, so how do they get their bonuses, right? All those factors will play a role in how you tell that story. And, and so you do need to tailor to the, that listener and that which is going to um, motivate them for, for different reasons. So it, it doesn't, and then even in the end consumer, whether it's uh, you know, luxury good versus, you know, practical everyday things, I think that, that also makes it beautiful. Mm -hmm. So you really need to understand that mindset. Yeah. And maybe a couple of more questions uh, and sure. then we can hand it over to Lanea. Okay. This might be, this is actually coming from me. Okay. <laughs> I know you, you, you go to amazing conferences and you are, have a great stage presence uh, and you, you tell uh, your story, a Hyundai story, cradle story. Typically, what is your message when you speak at the conferences? I mean, it's not talking about the mechanics of it, but what is the mm. underlying or the overarching message that you want to have the younger people or professional people, designers or designers to just like go home? Okay. Uh, it actually relates to the, the question that Cindy just asked, and I think about who is the audience. And that's really, for, for actually, it's kind of basic, quote unquote, basic uh, presentation skills like know your audience. And so I think about that a lot. And so I was 
if I talk to dealers, then I, I, and I, I believe that what's important for them, uh, among other things, is to know, tell them how is Hyundai innovating or investing for its future, and what are, therefore, what, how are we being set up to continue our success in, in products and so on. Um, if it's uh, to um, you know, people I want to recruit, then it's not talking about the vision. I'm talking about our mission. I'm talking about what they can do and how, how they can be part of a bigger story. Yeah. How to make sure you have those entry points uh, for that community to come in and build the brand uh, yeah. strategy or story it has been. Talking about conferences, I was there at a conference where you were speaking and talking about the theme for today's storytelling. I like the way you put the analogy of uh, bigger numbers. I think uh, you made an analogy of a oh, yeah. chess board. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, Exponential. Can you, can you, can you tell, tell us about how sure. the analogy So it's difficult to grasp a big number, but the way you use an analogy of a chess board from a uh, square to square, mm -hmm. what, yeah. can, you, can you remember that? So it's actually, it was, it was a chess, a chess board, but the story is that it was invented uh, by someone uh, perhaps in Persia or, or India, perhaps. India. In, in India. And uh, the king who um, this, this game was created for was so pleased with, the, with this game that he says, oh, as a reward, uh, what would you like for your reward? He goes, okay, um, what I would like is rice, but I would like the rice in this way. I would like one grain of rice in square one, two on the second, four on the third, eight, and so on. And, and the first four squares, he's looking at these rice grains, he goes, ah, that's uh, not a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, they cut to the short story. If you get to the 64th square, oh my God. if you look at how much rice grains are needed to fulfill the that promise, number, yeah. it equals the mass of Mount Everest. Wow. Imagine Mount Everest, that whole mountain, just rice. I That's hope. how much you get at the 64 square of this thing if you do 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. And sometimes it, that, that's a pretty amazing story. Hopefully the king did not promise it or else he would have gone <laughs> right. bankrupt. Like, oops. okay, oops, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'd like to wait for the next king to come. Uh, but it tells about the aspect of breaking it down for the audience, right? Know the audience. Not yeah. everybody would understand what a big number is yeah, or what a big massive system is. And this but you, you, it gives a... Uh, I would say a stepping stone, like imagine this, 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 and then race to 64, like, oh my God, that, right. that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. And this was, this is, uh, the, I think the context was what is exponential, what yeah. does exponential mean, yeah. and, and what does it mean to start, you know, in a, what looks like an initially slow pace, but then can, can really get out of, get big, you know. And that's the way of the tipping point also, you start planting your seeds and then eventually you go to the exponential part of tipping point yeah. and people say like I want to have, I got to have this product or right. this service or this experience. Right. Fantastic. I think we are a little bit uh, near to the end of the show. Uh, okay. Laneya, anything else we need to do before we hand it over to you or anything else you need to add as in parting uh, thing? Yeah, I just want to add one small thing. So I, I so my, my, my undergrad was at uh, um, Kettering but, now, but, but then it was oh, yeah. GMI. Engineering Management Institute up in Flint, Michigan. So go Bulldog! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> and apart from that, I know there are a couple of many questions, again, that are unanswered, but feel free to uh, write them uh, to, uh, to us, uh, either in the chat box or just email, uh, email to myself, Lanea, and we can, uh, we, can, we, can take, we can take care of them. Lanea, over to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you again very much, Jivak and John, again, for the great discussion. And thank you all again for hanging out with us today for the season finale of our 2019 SF webinar. And like Jivak said, if you have any other questions or just want to talk design with us, please feel free to drop us an email. Um, and we would also love to hear from you what you'd most like to cover in our next webinar series of 2020. So please feel free to shoot us an email. We're planning that series already, and as you probably know by now, Jivak is never short on ideas to share. <laughs> so please stay tuned for details on that in the next couple of months. Other than that, thanks again for coming, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Enjoy.